Okay, next patient, Mr. Silva, 40%. Tidal volume, 800. Rate, 10. PEEP of 5. Last gas, CO2 was up. Why does the resident have all that stuff on? Wait a minute, there's blood and body fluid precautions. Who's the attending? Dr. Daniels, infectious disease. Oh, great. This guy's got AIDS. They never tell respiratory care anything. Well, it was bound to happen sooner or later. We want to focus on one particular aspect of the AIDS crisis, so to speak. The emotional reactions that people have, the emotional overreactions that people have and concerns with working with AIDS patients. The doctors aren't always honest yeah. about the patient having AIDS. Yes. Um, we've had them not tell us before. The fear of dishonesty or not full disclosure. What is the medical world not telling us? Yes. Is the medical community telling all. What else? You have to deal with whatever comes through the door. You don't know the background of these people. Anyone is a potential AIDS patient as well as, you know, having any other number of problems. And it's not always a very clean business. It gets pretty messy sometimes. That's right. You don't want to do mouth to mouth on anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Because you don't know who's been exposed and is not telling or who's been exposed and they don't know it. My husband called me one night at work and I told him I was taking care of an AIDS patient. We have a newborn. He told me to leave my clothes at the back door. He'd burn them when he got home. <laughs> wow. We have some departments that will come onto the floor and they'll see a blood and body secretion isolation yeah. precaution label on the door. Mm -hmm. Everything they need to follow is right there, yes. but they want to know what the patient has. <laughs> well, of course, because they want to know so that then they can freak out. Right. <laughs> exactly. Tell me more. What else? There's still those group of questions that are not answered. The disease isn't old enough. How yes. long is it going to stay late? Right. When can it activate? There are a lot of things out there that we just don't know. I think there are two issues. And I say there's two issues. It's not either or. One is to have the information, the education, the knowledge, the, 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 the wisdom, to have the policies and procedures all clearly laid out to the best that you possibly can. But the second issue is, I can guarantee you, you can talk till you die of the facts. And if somebody's going to be overly emotional and overreactive, it's just like talking to a wall. Our first contact with the patient, we, we're just sort of cold. I mean, you know, we accept them, and then all of a sudden you start looking through the history, and you find out, oh, this patient is a possible AIDS. And, you know, your mind just starts racing. Oh, my goodness, what did I do? You know? Yeah. And it, yeah. it suddenly, you know, you change your attitude. What if I get it myself? That's the bottom line issue. We've got all these other dimensions, all these other factors that we worry about, the policies and the procedures and the information and the, the nature of the patient and all that kind of stuff. But the only reason why we're really worried about all this kind of stuff is the bottom line. Can I possibly get it? Now, how do you keep it in its perspective? And how do you do that mentally? How do you do that emotionally? See, the worst thing in the world would be to say, oh, come on, there's no problem. Come on, it's really safe. All these people are just trying to make waves. Well, the truth is there is that tiny little window. That window opens up a possibility not to have a cold, not to have a sniffle, but it's a long and painful death for most patients. And when you raise the stakes to that level of seriousness, that little window suddenly becomes an enormous issue. Dear sis, I'm about to leave for work. Dan and the kids are still in bed. I'm working ICU now, and I like it a lot. But Dan is really giving me a hard time about the AIDS patients. He's convinced that I'm going to bring the virus home and expose the kids. I've tried to talk to him about the precautions we take, but he just keeps insisting that I go back to peds. I'm not sure how I'm going to deal with this. I don't talk about it to my husband, which isn't fair because if I, if, you know, if something bad happens at work and I go home and I can tell him, you know, you know, I had a baby die today and he like, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, are you feeling okay about it now? But if I had to go work with an AIDS patient that was very ill and had a lot of secretions and I was kind of uptight about it, I can't go home and tell him that. One of your major support systems isn't it's available lost. to you in this context. 
So what's the matter with you? The one in 14. His boyfriend or lover or whatever you call it's been in the room with him for about 15 minutes. They're just hugging, oblivious to the world. Well, I've been together for nine years. The guy doesn't have much longer to live. I know that, but it doesn't change the way I feel. What about the business of homosexuality and people's personal reactions to it? Some of you may say, hey, I don't have any problem with it at all. It doesn't bother me at all. If somebody wants to be gay, if somebody wants to be heterosexual, bisexual, I couldn't care less. Some people have said, I just kind of don't like it. It makes me uncomfortable. And some people say, it's downright sick and, we are, and they deserve what they got, the bastards. It comes out in, in that whole range. In many cases, you'll hear people saying that this is the Lord's wrath being brought down upon those people. Do you ever find yourself starting to worry about that stuff with a particular patient that you know just passed through and maybe had some indication that they were a high-risk patient for some reason or it other? It makes me extremely disgusted with that whole sect of the population. Then I worry that I can't provide the um, level of care for that population group that would, you know, that you would be perfectly capable of providing for anyone else. Yeah, yeah. And that's tough to deal with. I mean, you're a professional person too, but you still have to deal with your own personal reactions. But what we're really concerned about here is how do you make sure that you're not exacerbating the emotional overreaction? Nobody's denying that it's serious. Nobody's denying that there's that tiny little window. How do you deal with that window in a functional, effective, rational manner? That's the issue. That's the focus here. Now let me show you something about that. We've got A's here. Now A's are specific situations that you run into, that you have to deal with. There's specific situations that you run into on a day-to-day -day basis. It might be having to draw blood. It might be having somebody come into the emergency room with several symptoms that might be indicative of an AIDS patient. Now C's represent two things, your feelings and your behavior. Now, in that situation, how you respond to that situation. Now, there's four screwball feelings. There's four screwball feelings that if you allow yourself to experience one of these four feelings, you are going to not handle the situation as effectively as you could and you will overreact. The first one is excessive anxiety. If you get yourself overly anxious, uptight, worried, upset, you could call it a lot of different words, but if you get yourself excessively anxious, you're going to overreact and not handle that situation as effectively or as professionally as you'd like. The second one is excessive anger. If you get yourself overly angry, disgusted, outraged, you are not going to handle that situation or that patient as effectively or professionally as you'd like to. The third one, I call it depression, but a lot of people just call it burnout. There's no real strong emotional response. It's just like, I've had it. And the fourth is guilt. And it's there. Let's say that the person at point C gets angry. You didn't say anything to either of them, did you? I didn't say a word. But what did you do? I did the job I was supposed to do, and then I left. Now, it might be subtle. It might be what psychologists call passive-aggressive behavior, you know, just the abrupt boom, 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 not being quite as sensitive, certainly not being responsive to the emotional state of the patient. See, those are the behaviors at point C. You could take any one of these things. Dealing with your spouse or relatives, what's the feeling? It sounds crazy, but at times I actually start to feel guilty about caring for our AIDS patients. Dan's got this notion in his head that I can pick and choose who I care for. I can just imagine what he'd say if he saw me doing some of the procedures that I have to do. I know he'd absolutely blow up. To make matters worse, he's been talking to mom and she's starting to ask questions. That's all I need to have the whole family on my case. Let's say that you're simply, uh, the first time you had to deal with an aged patient, what was the likely feeling? You know, the first time. Right. Yeah, anxiety, right? Now calm down. I've got to do this by the numbers. Thank God this guy's really out of it. Should I call my supervisor? Maybe I should get someone to assist. 
ridiculous. Come on, calm down. You've done a thousand blood gases. If I said to you, if you want to make sure that you handle these situations in a professional manner, very simple. Just make sure that you never get yourself excessively anxious, angry, depressed, or guilty. <laughs> Piece of cake, right? Done. No problem. It's not that simple, is it? And this is where people make the mistake all the time. All the time. Most people say that A's cause C's. That these are the things that made me anxious or made me upset or made me angry. Well, believe it or not, A's do not cause C's. We think that way, we talk that way, we explain our world that way. We say, gee, you seem kind of freaked out. You seem kind of agitated today. What's the matter? Well, I just found out I've been working with an AIDS patient and a doctor knew it all along and didn't tell me. You say, well, gee, you know, uh, uh, gee, you seem kind of upset. What's the matter, Carol? Well, well, gee, I mean, I just had this exchange with my husband on the phone and he told me to burn my clothes, you know, just because I was working with an AIDS patient. As though A cause C. A's don't cause C's. If A's don't cause C's, what do cause C's? B's. <laughs> Brilliant. But what are B's? We run into a situation, any of these, or any of the day-to-day -day examples of these things, and what happens at point B before you wind up feeling and acting at point C? You think. The way you think will determine how you wind up handling the situation. The way you think about it, and I don't mean the facts. The facts would help you to think rationally about it. But I can guarantee I've seen lots of people who had the facts still don't think rationally. And there's three screwball ways of thinking. Actually, there's only four ways of thinking in the whole world. That's the good news, because it's nice and easy to remember just four of them. The bad news is that three out of the four ways that you could think stink. The first type of thinking is called awfulizing. And we awfulize about all kinds of things. It's a perfect context to look at awfulizing. Every awfulized thought could be started with the phrase, what if dot, dot, dot. What if I don't get the artery on the first try? What if he calmed down? What if I get a needle stick? Now concentrate. There. There's the artery. There it is. <sighs> the second one. Shooting. Some of us are absolutely dynamite at shooting. We shoot on ourselves. <laughs> we shoot on other people. Or how about some of the ways that we shoot on the homosexual? Look. I don't care what they do with the door closed. I just don't see why we should have to watch. Joan, you really should try and develop a little more of a tolerant attitude. Wait a minute. This. Let's get something straight here. He shouldn't have been doing those things in the first place. And we shouldn't have to put up with the very thing that caused this disease. Third one is 180 degrees opposite. Rationalizations. Rationalizations are where you do the exact avoidance kind of thing. Some of the things we were talking about before. So what? Who cares? Big deal. Doesn't bother me. How do you rationalize the conflicts in your relationship with your spouse versus your relationship to your uh, profession? You have to rationalize it in order to say, well, we just don't talk about it. I really feel like I'm caught in a bind. I'm determined to continue critical care nursing. It's challenging, and I'm good at it. I don't know how I'll feel in a year. We've lost seven AIDS patients on our unit since I started, and that's really taken a toll on all of us. Of course, it's impossible for me to talk to Dan about that. For the time being, I'm not saying anything at home about AIDS. It's just not worth the aggravation. That gets you through the day, doesn't it? That gets you through the incident the rationalizations, the cons, but they sure don't get you through the ongoing process that you have to deal with in the long run. At some point, you got to deal with the real questions. And you have to be real clear about what it is that you're going to think. Not just what facts you know, not just what procedures you know, but how am I going to deal with it emotionally? There's a fourth option, fortunately. 
it comes out, well, it's what's called the rational option, and they come out like this. I want, I'd like, I'd prefer, it would be better if, dot, 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 dot. I'd like to have perfect knowledge. I'd like to have procedures that are absolutely guaranteed that if I follow these procedures, there's absolutely no way, no way possible that anything could happen to me. I'd like all AIDS patients to be charming, scintillating, and thoroughly enjoyable to work with and totally in agreement with my philosophy of sexuality. If that was the case, great. If it's not, is it awful, terrible, horrible, the end of the world, and I get to make myself excessively anxious, angry, depressed, guilty, frustrated, upset, hassled, harried, irritated, and wind up not uh, giving the kind of care that I have committed myself to giving? No. It's unfortunate. I regret it. I'm concerned about it. And I'm committed to doing a good job. I think it's great. I mean, you know, the, the theory itself is, is fine, but in a highly stressful situation, like in a healthcare situation, um, it could be, I could see where it could be difficult to apply. I mean, even if you've got this down pat and you've thought it out you know, absolutely. thoroughly. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. And, and the point that uh, you said it very tactfully, as opposed to saying, yeah, but I don't think it's going to work in this situation. <laughs> is it, I think the reality is that it is harder to do it in the crisis situation. The stakes are larger. The moment is quicker and sudden. Consequently, it's even more dramatically important that you learn how to get control of it instead of it running you. And by the way, it's not just in a medical situation. Anytime you're in any kind of crisis situation, your first inclination is to overreact. Does overreacting prevent the acquisition of AIDS? Does it make you feel any better? It may help relieve some of the anxiety. Does it make it go away? It doesn't make it go away, but it helps, um, helps you to feel better if you have a healthy outlet to ventilate your feelings. Yes, exactly. And I really believe that, that some people believe that if I can just get it off my chest, then maybe I can put it, put it to rest and, and then go on and do my business. My only concern is that that isn't what happens with a lot of people, is that they do that, and then they go off and they don't do their business in a professional manner because of all the stuff that they did agitating themselves. Uh, we may work through this rational thoughts to ourselves yes. and everything be just fine, yet um, when you're actually ready to do a procedure or do something with a patient, to have a physician or a nurse who you respect at the last minute say, I wouldn't do that, yes. it just takes so little to have that irrational thought That's creep back right. up and That's build. Right. Physicians probably have just as many wacko overreactions about AIDS patients as any other population, the physicians ought to be talking about what the heck is my feeling about this person? What are my biases? What are my fears? You know, because in fact, they probably set a standard for everybody else. And they can throw a curveball in there that you really got it together. And somebody throws one of those curveballs in there like you're talking about and can set the whole unit reeling in uncertainty. Okay, now I want to go over the three steps for changing your thinking if you find yourself overreacting or that you might be overreacting to a particular situation. Let's say that you find yourself getting uh, agitated, uh, uh, overreactive in some situation. You're having to deal with something that you feel strongly about. So the first question is, what are you thinking to yourself about yourself? What are you thinking to yourself about the others in the situation? And what are you thinking about the situation? The second step in the process is to ask yourself two questions. What's true? What is actually verifiably true? What are the facts? And then you ask yourself the second question, what's not true? And the third step is very simple. You teach yourself to think in terms of preferences. Coming down to step three, when you substitute the, the realistic preferences, you're not getting rid of your feelings. What you're doing is getting them down to a level that you can still maintain your professionalism, you can still work with the patient in a functional, effective manner, and you can still take good emotional care of yourself as you're going through your responsibilities and commitments. You are going to have to deal with it one way, shape, or form, some way. And what I'm saying to you is that the best way that you can possibly do it is at step three, that you think in terms of preferences, 
I'd certainly like to not get AIDS. I would prefer that this not be a contagious disease. It would be better if I didn't have uh, any even minuscule uncertainty about this. But that's not the, the, the case. Consequently, I am concerned. I regret that. It's a serious issue. And I am committed to doing a quality job. I want to be real clear with you about one thing. I am not suggesting, and I'm not suggesting that you believe that if you did contract AIDS, it wouldn't be awful. This is one of the few experiences in the world where, in fact, the event really, truly is awful. There are very few things in the world that really, truly are awful. I mean, we think divorces are awful, and we think this thing is awful, and that, you know, I lost my car in an accident, and this is awful, and that's awful, you know. We, we, we awfulize about things that, frankly, just pale by comparison. The whole point about this, what we call rational thinking, is not to eliminate your feelings. You can't. It's impossible to eliminate feelings. The simple goal is to get those emotional reactions down to a level that you can function professionally, that you can take good care of yourself emotionally. 